Do you really want to be the person to cost your company a lot of money because you decided not to follow the law? In this video, we're going to talk about the laws and regulations that you need to be aware of in order to keep your company out of hot water. If this is the first time that we're meeting, welcome to my channel. My name is John Good, and here I get to spread my passion for cybersecurity training, tips and tricks, and career advice to help you go further. Remember to smash the thumbs up to like this video, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss future content, and leave a comment for the YouTube algorithm. If you like this training and you want more, head on over to my website at johngood.com to get access to full training courses that are uninterrupted. If you just want to donate to support the channel, that's cool too. Visit the link in the description to donate. You can also join me on the Discord server. The link is in the description. All right, let's get into the video. In information security, dealing with legal and regulatory issues is like breathing and that it happens all the time. The requirements you have to comply with are going to vary by the country that you operate in, the industry that your company serves, and even possibly the products or services that your company sells. Even though the CIS focuses heavily on US-based regulations, every professional in this industry has requirements that they have to follow. In this video, we're going to go through the different types of laws that exist, as well as talk a little bit about privacy. All right, let's begin. There are three different categories of laws that we're going to go over. The first one is criminal law, then we have civil law, and then administrative law. The first category of law is criminal law. Criminal law is what most people commonly associate with prison sentences as the penalty for disobeying the law. You might have heard about hackers associated with criminal underground rings or websites that sell credit card information or drugs, and then they get sentenced to prison. At the federal level, these laws are passed by a majority vote by both the House of Representatives and the Senate. At the state level, there are representatives that pass laws as well. Criminal laws are the ones that can get you into the most trouble. And if you end up being involved with criminal law, whether it's as a witness, a defendant, or a victim, you should definitely seek out the advice of an attorney. I mean, honestly, how many times have we seen people get themselves into trouble in the courtroom because they just want to do it themselves? Civil laws are not crimes, but they're disputes between individuals and organizations. Just like criminal law, civil law has to be passed by the legislative process. A couple examples include contract disputes and employment matters. The main difference between criminal law and civil law is the role of the government. With criminal law, you're going to see law enforcement step in to apprehend suspects. With civil law, law enforcement might take action in order to keep the peace, but the government's real role is to be an impartial arbiter as the judge and the jury. In the United States, both criminal law and civil law are defined in the United States Code, the USC. Administrative law is the policies, procedures, and regulations around daily operations for government agencies. For example, you might have a law on a specific subject, but administrative law states how you are going to accomplish that enforcement for the agency. In the United States, administrative law is published in the Code of Federal Regulations, or the CFR. Administrative law can't violate criminal law or civil law, and all three types of laws cannot violate the United States Constitution. Remember, your job is not to know the laws inside and out. You should learn about the laws that are impacting your organization, but seek legal advice from a knowledgeable attorney for complete understanding. Don't do it yourself. Don't get yourself in hot water thinking that you know the law better than you do. Your job is not to be a lawyer. Your job is to be a cybersecurity or information security professional. There are many laws that I'm going to cover that are shown here on the slide. Remember, you are subject to the laws that govern the areas where your company operates. I hope that you're enjoying the content in this video so far. If you are, make sure that you hit the thumbs up to like this video. And if you think of any questions, let me know down in the comment section below. All right, let's get back to the video. Interestingly enough, if you watch the news and congressional testimonies, you'll see that understanding of computer crimes or regulations is still an area that needs to be evolved. Let's start with the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, the CFAA. This was the first major cybercrime specific legislation in the United States. It's primarily focused on tampering with or using federal systems to commit a crime or fraud. 
The CFAA includes impacting the ability of a financial institution to use their computer systems. Convictions must follow the federal sentencing guidelines for the CFAA. In 1991, there were guidelines identified to help judges interpret computer crime laws that include the Prudent Man Rule, which requires senior executives to implement due care. This means that we've implemented an information security program. Due diligence, meaning that we've continued to improve our information security efforts. And burden of proof for negligence, meaning that to be guilty, we must neglect legal obligations, we have to fail to comply with recognized standards, and we have to frequently be doing both of these things. It can't just be a one-time event. National Information Infrastructure Protection Act of 1996, this act protects computer systems used in international commerce, as well as systems used for railroads, gas pipelines, power grids, telecommunication circuits. Any violation of this act is considered a felony offense. Federal Information Security Management Act, or FISMA, FISMA requires government agencies and contracts to implement a security program. NIST is responsible for the implementation guidelines for FISMA. Key components of FISMA include periodic assessments of risk, cost-effective control measures are implemented, security awareness is conducted for our personnel, and business continuity planning is implemented. In 2014, three major things happened with cybersecurity laws. One, a new FISMA was created called the Federal Information Systems Modernization Act, and it assigns cybersecurity responsibility to the Department of Homeland Security with the exception of defense and intelligence issues. Two, the NIST is required to develop voluntary cybersecurity standards, also known as the NIST 800 Special Publication Series. You might have also heard of this series called by its other name, the Risk Management Framework. And three, the National Cybersecurity Protection Act was released. This requires the Department of Homeland Security to establish a National Cybersecurity Communications Integration Center. Now let's talk about intellectual property. Copyrights protect against unauthorized duplication of work. For example, with software, this can protect the source code, but it will not protect the general idea. Trademarks include words, slogans, or logos that can be used to identify a company. This is distinguished by a TM for trademark or R for registered trademark. Patents protect intellectual property rights of the inventors. A semi-downside of patents that you might hear about is that they require you to disclose certain aspects of the property, such as how something is done. You might also hear about patent trolls who collect all these patents and they look to legally go after people who infringe on a patent, even though they might not actually use the patent themselves. Trade secrets are critical information for a company and allow a competitive advantage. You might protect this information using things like non-disclosure agreements or internal protections versus filing these as patents. Now let's talk about licensing. Licensing is one of those things that you should be aware of in information security. Depending on the service or the provider, there are likely licensing agreements that the company must agree to. When dealing with open source software, you might even see that in the licensing, it says it's free for home use, but if you use it for commercial use, it's not. Or that the developer owns part of anything developed with or using that software. Be very, very careful. Depending on the sector or products of your company, there might be import or export regulations. For example, there's the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR, that restricts military and defense items. Likewise, there's the Export Administration Regulations, or EAR, which restricts products that might be for commercial use, but they can also double for military applications. For example, something like satellites. Finally, there's also restrictions on exporting encryption products, especially around the strength of encryption. Privacy is one of those issues that's getting in the spotlight more and more in recent years. I wanna hit on a few key privacy regulations on the next two slides. The United States Constitution Fourth Amendment is the basis for a lot of privacy regulations in the United States. There's also the Electronic Communications Privacy Act of 1986 that makes it a crime to invade the electronic privacy of an individual. The Communications Assistance for Law Enforcement Act of 1994 requires it to be possible for law enforcement to use wiretaps if they have a court order. The Economic Espionage Act of 1996 enforces theft of economic information as industrial or corporate espionage. And the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, or HIPAA, requires privacy and security protections of healthcare information. 
The Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act of 2009 updates HIPAA and it requires breach notifications when it affects more than 500 individuals. Children's Online Privacy Protection Act of 1998, or COPPA, protects children online and it requires parental consent for those children under the age of 13. Graham Leach Bliley Act of 1999, GLBA, deals with the sharing of financial information. The U.S. Patriot Act of 2001, this was a response to 9-11 in the United States, and it broadens the powers of law enforcement and intelligence agencies to monitor electronic communications. And then we have the European Union General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, which provides requirements for collecting data in the European Union. Compliance is an area that might contain requirements for your industry, but isn't necessarily dictated by a law. For example, there's the Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, PCI DSS, that provides requirements on protecting payment cardholder data. Although we aren't gonna dive deep into compliance requirements, you need to understand that there's a lot of different compliance requirements out there depending on your industry. The most important takeaways are that you should be aware of all the laws that apply to your organization and utilize your legal team to make sure that you're staying compliant. Now, question of the day, which laws affect your company the most? How difficult are they to comply with? Let me know in the comments below. Remember to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure to check out my website at johngood.com for more training courses, and I'll see you next time.